And so uh, again, thank you very much. Um, Mairead, if you want to um, uh, say a few words and then introduce, dive right into technology. Sure, good morning, thank you. Thank you, Senator. Um, thank you everybody to be, for being here. And I just, I do want to dive right in. Um, appreciate, I know there's a lot going on, but we talked a little bit about technology last week and about long-term care communities and what we could do outside of staffing, right? And having other people there. What are some technology solutions that are available and accessible for individuals who may be older adults or maybe have um, a challenge related to a diagnosis? So. Um, Chris Thompson is joining us today from Oak Hill, and Chris, thanks for being here. Um, he's worked with us regarding the assisted living, sorry, the residential care homes um, and the tablets, making sure that they um, were accessible for those residents. Um, we've partnered, I know Oak Hill's partnered with a lot of the state agencies um, in different ways to meet individualized needs. So I will hand it off to you, Chris. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you everyone for your time. And uh yeah, that's um, I've I've uh, kind of been in this realm for a while now. I've done a lot of presentations and presented at conferences. I do home assessments, and like she, uh, she said, I have been involved in quite a few programs over the summer, matching technology to people and helping them gain more independence and mainly stay socially connected uh, during this uh, pandemic. But um, do I have the ability to share my screen? I can present some technology options and I'll go ahead and uh, get started on that. Yeah, Chris, you're all set. Excellent. All righty. So there's three different... Um, presentations I'm going to show here. These, they will kind of, I think, touch on all the information uh, you're looking for. Um, this one's going to kind of touch on kind of teleconferencing. Uh, I think it kind of fits the gamut of accessible technology and technology to help people get connected. And there is a continuum for assistive technology from low tech to high tech. And I'm going to try to give examples of each and even medium tech. Uh, these are the three most popular options that I have uh, kind of recommended. And I've noticed that people are most comfortable with. Uh, ideally, it would be a smartphone or tablet because of all the capabilities. But I know that when I make recommendations that it really needs to be something that the user is comfortable with, or it's just going to be uh, a big paperweight. So we really try to make sure to match <laughs> <laughs> the technology to, to, to the comfort level to ensure that it's going to be utilized. And that can be a telephone, which could be a lower tech item, um, a computer, which I think has been the most popular during the pandemic. I've noticed that the comfort level for a computer is by far number one, and there is a lot of accessibility there. Uh, laptops, for the portability have been very popular, but they do make all-in-one computers now, so you don't have to have the big monitor PC separately. It, it's all kind of built into one unit, kind of like in the picture here, which is ideal. In a smartphone or tablet. And then I'm gonna go over some examples of each. There are, uh, here's three examples of some accessible telephones. The one on the left is very loud, has a very loud ringer, very loud, uh, very bright flash. Um, and then you can actually on this, this is a Panasonic cordless phone. You can pair it with the cell phone so that it rings for the cell phone. And it has, but it has kind of like the older familiar cordless home phone interface. The middle is for someone who may be uh, visually impaired. You could program numbers into the phone and put someone's picture over the button. So it's very easy to make a phone call uh, just by pushing the person's uh button with their the picture of their face on it. Um, again, that one has a very loud ring as well. The one on the right is by uh, Hamilton Captel. That's a caption phone that transcribes. Uh, and these are great ways, lower tech ways to help people take advantage of telemedicine or stay connected in a more accessible, easier way 
Computers have a number of options to be more accessible. There's a, uh, keyboards right on the left of your screen. Uh, the one in the upper left is called an Orbi Touch, and it's much uh, easier to use for someone who may not be able to use the traditional keypad. Um, and then there's for the one in the middle for someone who may be visually impaired, much higher contrast keyboard, a number of different ergonomic options for keyboards. Same with the uh, mouse. You could really customize the, these technologies to fit the user, which is always ideal instead of trying to make the user adapt to the technology, which is really the wrong way to go about it because there's so many options. And then monitor screen size, bigger is usually better. Um, and then there's the, built into computers. There's a lot of magnification built into the accessibility of windows, for instance, screen reading capabilities for someone who's visually impaired to have components of the screen read to them. Dictation for text where you can uh, touch or select the microphone button on the screen and speak what you want to say instead of typing it. And then contrast options as well for visually impaired. Smartphone or tablet, there's a number of options there from a smartphone to uh, in the middle. That's an example of, it's called Birdsong, but it's an example of a tablet, kind of like a grand pad that's got a very simple interface and it just really simplifies uh, the use of a tablet where they only have a few options to select common things like video chat or access to the internet, games, videos, and then uh, the tablet to the left, which I will get into the accessibility of tablets too. They are just amazing with what all is built in. Cases and stands. I love the, the uh, stand to the left. It's detachable, so it can go onto a countertop. And um, I think that uses magnets and you can attach it and then pull it off. Very easy to, to attach and reattach. The one in the middle is probably the most popular for uh, not completely hands-free because you still have to select things here and there, but it's much easier to use to not have to hold the tablet and to be able to put it on a, a countertop. Those are very popular cases. And then the rolling stand on the left, that is very, I don't, hopefully you can see that. Yep. You can kind of move the iPad around based on if someone's in a wheelchair, if someone's in a chair, or if they're, you know, however they're comfortable, the stand really adapts to them and can go from room to room. Um, and then smartphones and tablets have so much built in, so much accessibility. That's why I kind of, I really like them a lot with the magnification for magnifying a prescription bottle, a newspaper, a, um, instructions on food items. There's so many things you could utilize and the magnification is, is magnificent. Um, screen reading and zoom for someone who's visually impaired to have elements of the, their screen read to them so they can navigate their, um, phone uh, without having to do it visually or they could have uh, elements of the screen zoomed and kind of blown up voice control which is getting better and better with siri google assistant to be able to control uh, elements of the phone and um, there's been a new update that has come out recently that really just especially in the iphone lets you gain a tremendous amount of hands-free control by using siri and a, a an accessibility setting called voice control. Hearing, you can uh, use your uh, smartphones with hearing aids, set up an LED flasher for whenever you get a notification or alerts, turn on closed captioning and transcription to be able to read uh, like what's being said in a video. In the middle, it's dictate text, which I love to be able to not have to use the tiny little keyboards on the screen, push the microphone button and speak what you want to say and have it populated in the screen. And then access to a plethora of accessible apps um, like live transcription, video relay services for someone who is hearing impaired, uh, communication apps to be able to use to for someone who may not be able to speak clearly. Um, there's so many, so many apps. Um, so I'm going to bring up a different screen here because I know there are some concerns for um, other, oh, one second. Yeah, we'll go this real quick. 
Okay, I'll try to, there's two more, but I'm gonna try to get through these really quickly. Uh, I think that's the same one I just showed, one second. Stop share. You know what, I'll go to this one because I'm having a hard time finding the other one. Okay, so this is a big concern for a lot of people. Let me get to the right slide. Is Alexa always listening? And how secure is your smart speaker? Um, the short answer is it is always listening, but that's not really the concern. The concern is, is it always sending information to the cloud or to uh, through the network? And that's no. It has to always listen in order to hear the wake word when you say it, but it's not always connected. It only connects to the cloud or to the Amazon cloud once you say Alexa. And anytime it's connected or anytime a call comes through or if drop-in service is enabled, there's always gonna be an indicator on the Alexa device. There's gonna be a light on or a blue light, a yellow light, a green light. There's, there's gonna be, and you're gonna hear an indication, you're gonna know, or when you say the wake word, you're gonna know when it's connected and when there's actually information being transmitted. Boop, boop. Um, so what happens when you speak to Alexa, that's kind of when the it, it connects to the Amazon cloud and then you give the command and it needs that connection in order to be able to stream music or, or give you the results of the question you need. Um, sometimes something is said that sounds similar to Alexa and that's getting better at not waking up when it hears something similar to Alexa, I think that's improved over time. But anytime it does, it pretty quickly determines whether or not you meant to do it. And then you can, uh, it'll automatically cancel out. And you can always go into your history in the Alexa device and see what has been said, what has woken it up. And uh, that's in the Alexa app under settings and Alexa privacy. And uh, kind of a, an obvious tip is put it in an area that's a common area, not an area that may need privacy. Uh, you can just put these on a timer. You could plug it into like a, a plug or a smart plug that goes into the wall and only have it to where it's on during certain times, if that helps with any kind of privacy concerns. You can uh, review all voice recordings again in Alexa. Uh, privacy and everything that's said is deleted um, automatically after uh, three or 18 months, which is something you can set up. Um, this is some information too. How does Alexa use your voice recordings? Um, again, uh, the, if you just use it like it is out of the box, it's really not gonna use a lot of information that you say, if you start uh, implementing things called skills and start introducing third-party services into the uh, Alexa device, that's when information is more open and vulnerable. But out of the box, just for using for basic Alexa, Alexa features, it's pretty secure. Can others on my Echo account see what I'm saying to Alexa? Yes, so if two people have the Alexa, uh, app on their device, they both have access to whatever is said on the device. Um, for example, if a husband and wife have an Echo device and the wife is ordering things through the Amazon Echo, the husband can go into the device or to the, the app and see everything that's said, um, all the uh, commands that have been given. So that's something to keep in mind. Uh, and then again, this is how you get to the settings of to, to view all the Alexa privacy settings. If you go into the Alexa app, hit settings and Alexa privacy. And I definitely recommend exploring that. There's not a lot in there. It's pretty simple and streamlined. There's a mute button on all Alexa, Alexa devices. And when it's muted, it turns red. So you know that it's muted. Uh, if you have one of the smart displays, there is a shutter 
uh, on a lot on most of them. The biggest one, I don't think there is the Echo, the big 10 inch one, but the Echo Show 5, the Echo Show 8, they all have shutters to, to uh, slide over the cameras. And for Google Assistant, it's everything's pretty similar, but to get to Google privacy settings is a lot more challenging. Um, but here are the directions on how to do that. And I can send this to you if you need it. Uh, and then one more thing I wanna show real quick, if I can find the uh, PowerPoint. Sorry, it's showing up on my, uh, it's not giving me the option to find the right one. Anyway, uh, I'll try one more time. And if it doesn't work, then we'll just skip it. Let's see, technology to combat social isolation. That's the one I really want to show you. I'll try one more time. There it is, boom. Okay, I'll quickly go through this one. This is a presentation I've done about different technology types to combat social isolation. I think I've hit on pretty much everything uh, except for, let me see, smart displays and speakers. I'll just quickly go through this in case there's something else I left. Yeah, because the, the main reason I love smartphones and tablets too is because it's not just about teleconferencing, it's about texting because that's the way many people stay in touch these days. Email, social media is just a huge way to stay connected. Uh, telehealth and everything is kind of portable and accessible in a smartphone or tablets, but they're not always ideal. But there's so much you can utilize with one from video chat apps, texting, email, social media, again, games are hugely popular. Music streaming is hugely popular. And then other great features you can utilize with a smartphone or tablet, like eBooks, audiobooks, blogging. Uh, so many people I work with just wanna be able to get into photography and take pictures, uh, writing, ride share services, reminders and prompting, which you could also use with a smart speaker. Uh, we've gone through that. And Amazon and Google are kind of the most popular uh, smart speakers and displays. Which one do I recommend? It's it's um, it kind of depends again on what someone's already comfortable with. If they prefer a Google Assistant or Alexa, but I do find that Alexa does have more compatibility for smart technology if they want to control things around the home with their voice or um, capabilities. There's so much you could do. You could have Kindle books read through your Alexa device. Uh, even if it's a text-based book, Alexa will read it. I think that's a great feature. Uh, some more things you can do with those devices, stream podcasts, listen to like uh, uh, tune in radio, hear radio stations from across the world, hands-free calling to be able to say, Alexa, call Cindy. That's a huge accessible way to be able to make calls. Hands-free messaging. And then you could also book rideshare services too. Um, I think that is... There's again the grand pad for an easier interface. And I think that pretty much covers it. I didn't want to take up a whole lot of time. So uh, yeah, please let me know if you have any questions. So, so Chris, this is Kathy Austin. I'm one of the co-chairs with Maraid. Thank you very much for coming on. Um, uh, I have a couple of questions. So uh, we have been looking at for both assisted living and nursing homes and increased use of technology. And one of the um, uh, concerns that some of the um, uh, congregate housing environments have is privacy vis-a-vis -vis the roommate of someone that's there. And so uh, you indicated that um, there were ways to um, uh, there were ways to address the issues of privacy. Can you just go into that a little bit? 
Um, is this about a particular device or just generally, like is for a smart speaker or a tablet? Well, we heard that a lot of the Alexa slash Echo devices were being removed from some certain living environments. And we were trying to find out, you know, why, uh, mm -hmm. what were the concerns? And it, you've touched on privacy with both Alexa and Echo. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that there are ways that this can be the, the challenge of this could be addressed. And I just want to make sure that we're actually talking about this component because the mm -hmm. legislature has looked at technology before and has never really finished the discussion with a piece of legislation. And I'm hoping that this year we can come up with a piece of legislation that would address the technology and allow people um, to uh, have more contact. And so, for example, I have, a res I have a constituent who is in a nursing home. Their mother is in a nursing home and they live in Massachusetts. They can't come down regularly, got their mother a computer and had an, uh, you know, a lengthy discussion with the nursing home uh, to keep that there. Mm -hmm. But um, ultimately we're allowed to keep it there at certain times. So I just think that there you know, there are many reasons why um, some of this technology is necessary. And ultimately, I want to also say thank you very much for addressing the issue of hard of hearing or uh, people that uh, can't see as well. I think that we have to make sure that we're paying attention to this. And I also think that if someone has um, some forms of dementia, uh, that you gave some options here that uh, might be helpful. So I just wanted to know if you could address the tech, the privacy issue first, though. Thank you. Yeah, it's a great question. It's a very common question. And um, I think the ultimate conclusion is that it does come down to the comfort level of the, uh, the user or anyone who is in the vicinity of the device. You really have to weigh the pros and the cons or the comfort for the accessibility and the, the connection you get. And um it really, it, it ultimately comes down to who will be uh, in the area where the technology is. People, there is a stigma to the smart speakers because they're new, uh, because it does seem unusual or, 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 or especially for, for people that aren't used to newer technologies, because I also always have to to mention to people too that there's nothing in a smart speaker that isn't in a cell phone or isn't in a smartphone and and people take smartphones everywhere even i mean but again it, it, i think it really it ultimately is a personal choice and um it, it varies by person to person uh but i, I do hope that um they will maybe educate a little bit about the privacy settings in the app and definitely go into the privacy settings and tailor the device to make, you know, reach that level of comfort because ultimately it really just comes down to the comfort level of the individual and weighing the options to whether or not it's worth it to gain a more accessible way to stay in touch. Um, thank you. I just think that we can address this issue of concern. Um, so, you know, I, 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 I'm, you know, I, I'm appreciative of the comments because, um, you know, this is a, a group that is talking about visitation and socialization and the socialization comment and com component of this is going to be have to be dealt with in a, in a variety of ways. And I think technology is going to help us out and make it far easier for people to still see people in quotes and hear from people. And I don't think this is gonna be the only pandemic. Um, and there's also concerns in nursing homes and assisted living when someone, when there's a flu epidemic that's happening or anything like that. And so I think there's a whole host of ways that we can start addressing some of these issues. Um, are there any other questions? Um, Representative Hughes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Chris. This was a, uh, a really good, broad um, uh, way to 
address some of the solutions that we're looking at. My concern is that what I've noticed in practice and in trying to support um, loved ones, especially loved ones with some cognitive difficulties with um, assistive technology, is that they gravitate towards the low tech solutions. Like it's really, really hard to get um, usually older folks to habituate to using even this device versus um, an old fashioned receiver where they can really focus on what they're hearing in their ear and talking and it's just coming from this one source. Mm -hmm. um, so I feel like in this moment with this um, huge barrier to socialization and, and visitation that, that is, is, is an essential need, we have to find a bridge of low tech solutions to meet those folks where they're at because we cannot train them to adapt to new technology in this crisis because we're not there to provide that. And there's no staffing there to provide that habituation training. So, we, so right now we need to find the best low tech solution for most folks. I mean, I'm, you know, of course, younger people that are used to using this as their main way, but, but even the little flip cell phones, they ha have much harder time um, pushing the buttons, you know, seeing low vision, there's all kinds of barriers. So how can we, um, how can we up, you know, you know, uh, not upsell, but, you know, up implement low grade solutions um, to help people just connect where they're at. That's, that's my question. Yeah, I completely agree. I think that in with technology in general, there is usually a curve. It takes time before it really becomes widely adopted and widely used and, and, and things like Alexa and, and all these smart speakers, they haven't been around very long at all. Uh, I think Alexa came out in 2014. Uh, and within the last 10 years, all of the stuff has just come about. And it's very unknown. And it takes um, some educating on how to utilize it. And it's constantly changing. And I do think it's kind of a curve that's, that's going to take some time before it's people feel as safe about it as they do like a smartphone. But um, I did want to address, but I do totally agree. You have to meet the people where they are with the technology they're comfortable with. But I did want to mention one thing because you mentioned about dementia supports. And um, since I am a smart technology specialist, of course, I love and prefer the, the smart tech options. But there are a number of options, even with a smartphone or with a smart speaker for things like reminders and prompting. There are ways to remotely connect into these devices and check on check on loved ones and to give hands free interfaces. There are sensors you could utilize for automation, things like lighting to come on automatically, putting sensors on doors and windows to know if if a door or window is open during a time when it might be a concern. But reminders and prompting for things like medication adherence and reminders are, are really huge. Yeah. Yeah. And if that can be uh, recorded in a loved one's familiar voice, I know with my own loved one trying to put an echo in, she would never use it, but other, she would enjoy other people saying, you know, Alexa, uh, what time is it? Or what's the weather? But she would never prompt it, you know, mm -hmm. that, that they're, they're so, so, you know, like, um, whatever we can initiate in terms of, 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 from outside the building to try to, you know, create some of those, um, remote reminders, like you say, or prompts or, or, um, talking to a person is helpful, but it's also confusing because they don't see you. Even if they're outside the window, they're like, I don't know who I'm talking to on the phone. It's me. It's <laughs> me you're talking to on the phone, you know, but, but, you know, it's just the, the new technology is very confusing to, to, to folks. So as much as we can normalize the old, even having um, cell phones look like the old landline receiver and so forth, mm -hmm. um, that, that's one step towards it being more user-friendly for, for this, for these folks that are cut off. That's, 
that's what I'm looking for. I completely agree. And I, I do think that since this, these devices are so new, they do require a lot of prompting from the user. And um, I do think that, oh, I do know that these companies, Alexa, Amazon, Google, uh, have realized that and they're not there yet, but I do think you're hitting the nail on the head with, I, there needs to be more of a prompting of the device to the user instead of the other way around, but it, it's going to get there eventually. It's just, it's not there yet. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, thank you. And I also think that people have to realize that in the next decade, people are going to be used to these devices. Mm -hmm. So there are people that are going to be entering nursing homes and assisted living places that have been using these devices. And so they'll become more comfortable as we move along. And the, uh, this has been a, my understanding in talking with some of the uh, disability community that these devices have been um, freeing for them. Uh, allowing them to participate in ways they never would have participated before. And I think that that's something that, that um, we have to recognize. And I also remind everybody that not every, as we saw in our talks with people who lived in nursing homes, not all of them are of the older generation, although clearly uh, we do have to deal with that component of it. And whatever policy we make today, we'll be able to help people in the future. Ray, did you have any questions or comments on Chris's work that he uh, presentations? I thank you, Chris. A few of the things that I learned that I I thought were great, especially when someone's listening in, that it lights up. I think there's actual things that we can take back as alerts, right? There's there's visual alerts, there's sound alerts um, that can offer some reassurance. And um, to Senator Austin's point, there may be other periods in time when we need this, but we know that individuals in long-term care settings address a level of loneliness um, and feeling disconnected when they first come into their previous life. This could connect them to their senior center or activities or music or things in a way that we don't currently have in place that we could do. Um, I think that we could be a best practice state and not just look at it for the pandemic, but what is the best for our long-term care residents in general when it comes to accessibility, um, individualized need, and having the most full life possible. So um, you know, every time we work together, I learn something else and we've truly benefited from um, all of the wisdom that you guys have um, in this technology. And I'll encourage people as well. Um, in Hartford, they do have a gym area um, and equipment and things that you can test out in different types of technologies. So if you have a loved one or someone or in a long-term care community where you have a problem and a re resolution you're trying to look for, um, please reach out to them. Thank you. And uh, hopefully in 2021, we'll be able to reopen our smart home on wheels so people can come in. And we have a whole station with, uh, with these devices uh, these voice control devices to uh, kind of get people some familiar familiarity with it and uh, hopefully get them uh, kind of help the flatten the learning curve, I guess. <laughs> um, so um, Mag or Matt, did you have any questions or comments or Sandy on um, Matt, go ahead. Yeah, th uh, thank you, Senator Austin. It's uh, hi, Chris, and thanks for your presentation. Um, it's just a, uh, my first question is uh, regarding uh, regarding the vicinity, and um, if you could talk a little bit more about um, who is in the vicinity, and uh, notwithstanding you know the, the addressing the privacy issues, I wanted to get a sense of who is in the vicinity, um, and. Um, in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a room with a, a roommate and family visiting in a bed next door, and the device is set up uh, with the other family, would that family be in the, the other family be in the vicinity? And if activated, would Alexa be recording the other family's conversations, uh, number one? And say uh, in the situation of, uh, say, a, a CNA, um, not directly communicating with uh, the family with the Alexa, but say conferring um, at the end of the bed or at the doorway uh, with uh, an, either another CA or another healthcare professional, or that CNA were talking to the family next door, 
would all those people be in the vicinity of what Alexa could potentially be capturing and recording? Yeah, it, it has quite a range on it. And um, there is a setting, I want to say, I need to check my notes, but I think there is a setting where you can stop your recordings from being, or when it's activated, you can stop it from being stored. So, um, and I don't think it actually records, like if someone makes a call through it, but I, I do think it's probably, you know, something to consider maybe like if there is, for instance, a, a camera in a public space, there's usually a sign or some sort of notice given that may be something worth considering for a family or someone visiting because right. yeah, it does have, it does have quite a range on it. Thank you. Chris, would it record even if you were just in the room talking or only if you initiate it? Only if it's initiated and there's a light on it. And then if someone does enter the room, you can, there is a mute button. You can mute it or you can unplug it, which is the, definitely an option people utilize. And just a, another quick question. Mm -hmm. These are just questions. These are not, I uh, hope they're not indicating my uh, opinion either way at this point. But uh, the second question is for families, say, um, say family A, mom and dad buy mom and Echo, uh, who's in the nursing facility, Mm -hmm. um, and they sort of have access to the controls and the settings and, and access to the recordings, mm -hmm. but they're not the only visitors per se, you know, in a family with more than one uh, family member, say uh, uh, sibling number two and three come in to visit, the, uh, they're in the vicinity and they have the potential to be recorded and family A, mom and dad have the only access to it. Have you come across those situations at Oak Hill uh, where, uh, where there's disputes among families, say if, or, or a family, um, you know, a member who is not the sort of fiduciary uh, and attorneys, or anything that can get a little situations among families though generally are good, but sometimes it can be, there can be controversies among families. Any comments on that? I've never, usually the only issues I have are on like the broader level, like for the facilities, kind of like this conversation we're having here. I've never really had any examples that I can think of where it's been on the family okay. level off All the right. top of my head. Thank you so much, Chris, mm -hmm. and good to see you. You too. Mag, I, I see that you're unmuted. <laughs> yes, I just wanted to thank Chris also. I thought this was very interesting, very helpful. Thank you. And, uh, you know, we've had conversations with Maraid also on just some of the issues and really trying to be conscious and sensitive to the privacy issues. Even like you said, with the cell phones, as people are using their tablets and there's roommates and sometimes you should become sort of, you know, even it's not even in a nursing home, just in general life, you, you know, you realize that there are privacy issues. So I really appreciate the conversation being broadened to, um, so everybody understands what we're talking about and, and what we need to do to help people protect privacy and as well as facilitating visitation and, and um, you know, interaction. So thank you, Chris. I really appreciate it. This was a great conversation. Thank you. Thank you. And I just want to clarify that if people are in a, in a room with an Alexa device, it's not just going to record a random conversation. It really needs to be uh, specifically activated. And if a command isn't given, if it's picking up a conversation, it knows it's picking up a conversation and it stops immediately. Um, Can I just ask, you did talk about the drop-in feature. And I think maybe that's what Matt was talking about, where if I, if I, given, if I have control, I can sort of just, I can activate it from a, a distance. Is that true? Yes, that is something that does have to be enabled. It doesn't come standard. When you buy the device, you do have to go in and enable that feature. And then uh, you do have the ability as someone with a uh, family member, loved one with the app to drop in and then you'll hear sound. You'll see a, a, a light and, and know that it is picking up two-way audio. So in that situation, it will pick up something in the in the area whatever is an earshot of the device Chris if at that point I if I was in the room and I went to visit my mom and I wanted to have a private conversation and I hit the Sandy? turned it red could anyone drop in at that point 
I mean, that's a good question. I, I think so, because I think that the mute only deactivates you from being able to activate it with your voice. I think that a person, I don't know for sure, but I'm just something trying we to could maybe I could experiment we, with that. Yeah. Could we tease that out? Cause I think that that would be really important to know mm -hmm. beforehand, um, you know, and to be able to inform people of what to expect from it. Yeah. That's a good question. I also, I also think that as technology changes and all these different things, we just have to be aware that there needs to be some flexibility as new things are created to be able to ensure people's privacy. Not, and sometimes it's not just even the roommate, but it's the resident themselves who may want to have some privacy. So I think we just have to be cognizant of the fact that these things are always going to be changing, new opportunities, and, and how do we make sure we still have the ability to control for some privacy. Um, Chris, can you share your presentations with us too? Uh, we, uh, uh, Mairead, uh, we have Susan Keene, who is our administrator, who takes all these documents. Would it be possible for us to get copies of those presentations you flipped through for us? Absolutely. I'll be happy to pass those along. Th thank you very much. Appreciate it. Um, I was looking for Sandy, but I think that she might have dropped off. Um, uh, I don't see her. Uh, and um, is there... Anybody from an assisted living place on right now, Annette? No. Yes, I'm here. Go ahead. Um, Do you have any questions for Chris? I, I don't have any specific questions, Chris. It was a great presentation. Uh, the, only, the only one specific question I had was with Wi-Fi connection, if you've got a building that has spotty Wi-Fi, how does that interfere or, or um, disable this, the systems that you've talked about? Yeah, if it's if it's spotty Wi-Fi, it could definitely cause some issues. Um, uh, yeah, you definitely want to have the the best high speed internet possible. Because I, I see that as an issue in several of our communities in assisted living, um, and I'm seeing some nods from other play people. So I'm guessing that's an issue in the sniff world as well. Would hotspots work? I was going to ask, could the family buy a hotspot or something like that? Right. That is a great question. I'm actually working on a presentation for that because people are looking for options. And uh, just so you know, uh, with hotspots, they can be more expensive than standard general internet because uh, they are, they do work through cellular companies. They do uh, sometimes start throttling your data after a certain threshold, and then it could s severely slow down your connection. Uh, these are things to take into consideration as opposed to, you know, you definitely have to weigh the cost. Um, but with my experience with hotspots, depends on the carrier. I do have to reset them pretty often, especially if I'm using a lot of data, almost daily, especially if I'm using it for things like video chat. Uh, so it, it can require more hands-on approach. Uh, things could be more promising with 5G coming out. I think those routers may be faster and more capable of doing things like this. Uh, but then again, you definitely should look into the cost because it may not be a more cost-effective option. Like a general internet in the building. Yeah. Ag, sorry. <laughs> Especially for an unlimited data plan. And then knowing that that could still be throttled once you hit a certain threshold of data through a hotspot. And I just want to go back. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry, I didn't want to interrupt. Go ahead, Mag. I'm sorry, I was just following up on the hotspot question because some of it's not just spotty, but sometimes, but there is some concern about the, the drain on the internet if several people have the devices. Do you have information on that? As far as a hotspot? No, just as far as like the general internet of the, of the nursing home or the assisted living, if you have several people using the the devices is that a real drain on it or is video more of a drain or i think it's more prevalent with a hotspot as opposed to uh, a home internet um i don't think it would be a noticeable drain for for standard cable internet they can it can handle quite a bit of devices audio and video or just audio or audio everything and video? everything yeah in my home alone i have quite a few ipads and and divide and then smart speakers and i don't even i don't even have like the, the top of the line wi-fi router and i don't have uh, the top 
data plan through Xfinity either, but it's, um, it's, it's great. It's great. Like right and now I have multiple iPads going, I have Alexa devices going and I'm doing the zoom chat and it's working great. Well, <laughs> I wish I was at your house doing my remote access while I was working out. I don't know, it seemed to be quite a dream, but it would, you know, but in a nursing home when you have 120 build people in the building and then plus you have the business office that is oh, really well. dependent on it and that's more what we're okay yeah in that situation to. yeah it can yeah it there's definitely a limit um so yeah yeah if it's a few devices here and there it's no problem but if it gets i'd say closer to 20 plus uh you should definitely talk to the internet service provider for your options for or the hotspot could be a, an option too for individuals the hotspot will handle up to 20 16 to 20 devices and the more you put on there the more it'll it'll start to bog down noticeably they have, and the more it will cost also yes <laughs> if they have internet in their room let's say they they have a cable tv in their room and they have internet or they've yeah they've cable tv can they just get internet on their cable TV in their room and then use that their individual device with a password. I've seen people do that for, mm -hmm. in, in assisted living and group home settings just to have their own connection with their own devices. And that's a very good option. It works great. Yeah, Marade, we, we use that in the independent living apartments. So they would just use their cable for the Alexa device. But like I say, it's really hard to train folks to activate it. And I was also thinking that, you know, thinking back to low tech, um, <laughs> my husband was a, a, a studio musician and he used to have a, a light that, um, that turned on when the phone was ringing. Mm -hmm. That kind of just simple low tech solution not a teeny tiny light, like a big light bulb yeah. light that goes on when it's being activated. That's what I'm talking about in terms of bridging because that could help protect the privacy and really uh, meaningfully alert the resident that it's going on and the other staff. But I wanna, I wanna, thinking, yeah. I wanna mention a site uh, that has a lot of great lower tech options called Independent Living Aids. I think it's ILA something but if you google independent living aids they have a number of lower tech options like the ones you're speaking of that are pretty unique that uh i've only been able to find there but i would definitely recommend looking into that and i would agree with you Anna. it can be challenging for some older adults and we have others that are very savvy especially individuals who maybe have visual um concerns and use it to read or read the paper or things like that. So finding that balance, I think Bag and Matt sort of, we're trying to find that balance between accessibility, um, interaction, support, and privacy. If I wanna to talk to my mental health provider and I don't want anyone else hearing, I wanna know that that's a private conversation and how right. do I fix that? Yeah, exactly. Thank you. So, um uh, are there any, I don't see any other questions for Chris. Um, uh, we love your presentations. If you could send them to us, we want to thank you very much because you've given us food for thought on this particular issue. And um, I think that it's something that we're going to try to figure out a component in our policy recommendations um, to uh, uh, to the overall uh, uh, umbrella committee. Uh, on technology and how we can figure it out a little bit more for people recognizing the clientele that are in nursing homes and assisted livings. Uh, Madam Chair, if I may, I, I didn't know that we could just join in. I've been waiting. So um, if I may just thank uh, Chris for the presentation and for the really excellent conversation about the use of technology. I think what we need to do uh, and looking forward to, to build upon the technology, but let's get, uh, I appreciate Representative Yu's comment. We need to find out where we can do the basics, overcome the privacy issues and just really work on getting everyone connected right now and then build upon the different uses of technology as we go forward. Um, I did appreciate hearing about the independent living aids 
if uh, we could get a little more information in that regard, I think that would move us in the right direction. And then we talk about how within the rooms, the roommates can give permission for the various uses of the technology and try to overcome those privacy issues. But I'm really fascinated by your presentation and all the great advances that we have in technology right now. But I think we're at the point where we just had iPads delivered to some of the nursing homes and the long-term care facilities during the pandemic. So we've got to take it at uh, an initial level and build upon it. And, but I'm very uh, appreciative of your presentation. And I apologize, Madam Chair, I didn't speak up earlier, thank you. Nope, that's fine. No, that's fine. Um, so thank you very much, Chris. Um, if there are no other questions for Chris, I have a couple of questions for Nick Bombase. Hi, Nick. Hello. How are you? Good, how are you? I'm good. Um, looking forward to seeing you again sometime in the next few months. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get so there. We're, we're going to be um, looking at some policies, Nick. And just so everybody knows, uh, Nick um, actually writes policy um, and the uh, uh, and our um, language that makes this what uh, what we're talking about um, actually affect uh, it, making it effectual through the uh, legislative process and through the statutes. So my question, um, Nick, I, don't, I know you've been on a few of our um, meetings and I'm curious, um, uh, would you think that, uh, uh, my sense is that we don't need to put this in legalese yet, that um, uh, there are templates that we might be able to use. And do you have any things that have happened in the past on technology or on socialization or visitation or recognizing essential caregivers that we could use as a basis for what um, we're looking at doing? Um, I imagine we do. I The first thing I would do is talk to Marie Grady um, because she probably knows more about the subject matter than I do on this. I'm yeah. sure she's worked on similar things in the past and would really have some sort of template to work from to, uh, I don't know, uh, I do agree with you, though, that this probably isn't something we need to put into full legislative form right now. Okay. Um, and so if we came up with like a, some, a little bit more than a bullet point, but not quite a, you know, a, 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 a full one pager on each issue, uh, you think that that would be, um, we flesh it out a bit, but we don't flesh it out so that it's got legalese in it. It's just a uh, common language. Would that be um, something that you would think would be okay? Yeah, I think that'd probably be the best way to go about it to start. Okay. Um, thank you, Nick. And I just wanted you all to know that Nick is on and has been on, been um, sort of listening in on us. And I think that it's important for us to understand that we don't have to come up with the, um, uh, the, the, um, legalese or the legislative speak, we can come up with common language and um, make that recommendation to the umbrella group and uh, talk about um, different policies. And as this is getting closer and closer, and Liz, I see you have your hand up, but I just wanted to sort of let people know that as we're getting closer and closer to doing what we're doing, uh, many of us will have other meetings. Um, and so, um, uh, Mairead has been made the uh, the host of this meeting right now because I'm going to pop off right at um, 11, which is in five more minutes. Um, and we have one more meeting after this that will talk about policy. And some people have sent around policy suggestions um, uh, to us. Uh, so I want people to be very much ready. So if you have a policy suggestion, um, a simple one paragraph, not a, you know, not more than that, a simple one paragraph on that sent to Susan Keene and we'll um, combine them all together. And then at the end of that time frame, um, uh, say, um, I would say Friday, but Friday's Christmas. So uh, maybe if you could get it out by to us by Thursday, we could send it around to everybody and then we could talk about those specific policy recommendations. 
so that um, uh, we're not trying to write things down um, on our essentially last day of recommendations. And I really want to focus on our lane, which is socialization and visit visitation. So if we think a policy is going to require additional staff, we can say at the bottom of that policy, this will require additional staff. And we are recommending staff, the staffing subcommittee um, decide what that number should be. This is going to require additional capital infrastructure. So for example, the, what Chris was talking about on us looking at um, uh, broadband or co connectivity issues, that should be something that the capital infrastructure team is making an assessment on. And all of them have put off their, um, their recommendations until the week after hours. And so we can say to them, hey, listen, we want you to address this issue here. Um, uh, it's gonna need uh, dollars on infrastructure. Um, so whatever it happens to be, uh, we'll make our recommendations uh, sans uh, the cost or sans the ac actual number of staffing because we don't need to um, validate that right now. I mean, there are many things that I'm concerned about with capital infrastructure and staffing and infection control that I still want to see addressed. But our role is to make those recommendations on socialization and visitation. And that's what I want to stay focused on because if we start trying to pull in all of the threads that go into everything else, we will not get this done. And our mm -hmm. goal is to get this done. And it does not mean that this is the only thing that's going to be addressed this legislative session. So if people have other things that they would like to see addressed this legislative session, please let one of the legislators know uh, we are all putting in different bills. Um, I know that that, that will make um, Nick and his uh, compatriots cringe. But um, because we are still in a pandemic and we've got to figure out a bunch of things, but there are uh, policies that we'll be talking about above and beyond what we're doing in this particular setting. So I don't want you to think that things are not going to happen. Um, so I, I just wanted to sort of let people know that we're not bound by doing only this all legislative session. There are other things that we will be doing that, that need to get done. Um, so, um, you know, I have, a, I have a few favorites that I put in every year. And so um, I will be doing something on senior centers and coming up with a more uh, long-term policy on senior centers and making sure each senior center is doing something more broadly. But that's been my issue for a couple of years and we almost got it passed last session. So it made it all the way out of the house and then didn't get voted on in the Senate the last time we were voting on things. So I you know, we all have things that we're working on. So I just wanted to let you know that component of it. And so, um, uh, Mairead, you are now in charge of everybody. Keep them in line. And Liz Stern has her hand up. Go ahead, Liz. And, uh, and I probably you, won't see you before the holidays. And I wish you all a very Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays. Enjoy yourselves, please. Thank you. Thank you. But stay safe. No <laughs> big parties. <laughs> Bye. Thank you, Senator. <laughs> um, I had uh, presented, I had prepared a statement for today, but we have only about a minute left. And so I will put that statement into, um, into my paragraph for policy. But um, I just want to make an announcement that probably some of us know, but most of us may not. And that is that today, Monday, the 21st, Rhode Island um, has starts their essential caregiver program. Um, a few weeks ago, Nebraska started their program. So um, I, uh, I stand firmly on that policy. I know there are several of us who do as well. Um, I've heard about the economics. Um, I've thought long and hard about the economics of this. And I think that supporting an EC policy may be as much as an economic opportunity as it is a moral imperative. And I understand, uh, I will put the rest of it into uh, my one paragraph that's gonna be challenging for me. But uh, with our neighboring state, uh, it, you know, going the EC route and, um, and in answer to what 
uh, Senator Austin said about the league lease, we have a significant number of documents that we can use. And I see Marae shaking her head. We do not have to reinvent the wheel. We do not, we are just late to the game. And it's not at a, you know, these are guidelines, but I think this may be a powerful measure, measurable indicator for a facility owner to see if it is working. Um, I think facility owners only have everything to gain by going this route. And I'll stop by, stop right there. Thank you. Liz, I appreciate that. Can I, can I just ask, can you, just so everybody has it, if you have the, um, a link to the Rhode Island. Um, oh yeah, I have it. Yeah. You throw that in there so people can read it and just have access to it easily. Murray, can I also, I mean, this was part of what I was gonna say at length today, but I, I've read every single policy from Florida, Texas, you know them all, so I don't have to go through them. There are some okay ones and there are some extremely weak ones. The Nebraska one is very weak. Um, and there are others that are very good. I, you know, you mentioned, Mairead, I love when you say we want to be a best practice state. I think we can learn by all of the previous EC documents and go for it and make it the best one. Um, and it doesn't have to be incumbent on CMS. The other eight states that have gone this route have not waited for CMS. Why is Connecticut waiting? You know, we don't have to even go to legislation on this. So I will send the links, but I don't like the Rhode Island one as much as I like some of the other ones. And I think that there are plenty of people who are crafting one for Connecticut right now. Um, and we just need to be let loose. That's all. Why don't you um, put them in the order? I know that you've worked with other individuals. So put yep. them in the order. Um, and I know there are some states that have found ways to work them in and work with the industry. Yep. Yeah, to support this and that some of the states have found it to be a helpful piece in the industry. So, Meg? Well, I'm speaking to the facility owners right now. I mean, I think that I didn't do that originally, but I've learned a lot over the last several weeks. And I try to sit in everybody's different seat at any given moment. And it's it's been quite a an eye opener for me. But in terms of fiscal responsibility, we this is this to me is, I'm sorry, a no brainer. Um, everybody wins, everybody wins. So on that, I'll, I'll go to work. Thank you, Mag. I'm just question, uh, just a question on the, um, the makeup of the, the uh, essential caregiver roles post September 17th yes. memo versus pre and have states modified it. It would be nice to know, or do, you, do we just have to sort of fit it into the compassionate care? category yes. and, and so that it's permissible? Yes. Okay. Yep. But again, there's, they're making it work in some places. I think it's something to look at. And um, Liz, thanks for providing that okay. information. So thank you. Marae, if I, I may, Makari, I also, yes. yeah, I have another meeting myself uh, right now, but I did want to just validate what Liz Stern had said. And if you look at what we've submitted at, as policy recommendations, I think this is an area that I think most of us agree needs to have our uh, undivided attention and we need to find a way to get something accomplished here. Working, of course, with Matt and Meg and how best to do this within the uh, facilities. So uh, I just wanted to put that out there and thank Liz very much for uh, really highlighting that particular component, because I think we can solve a lot of our problems going forward with the socialization piece if we get the uh, essential caregivers uh, in place appropriately. And then if I may just add very quickly, uh, on the other subcommittee uh, on the connectivity issues, I did mention that to the infrastructure committee. And I think that's going to be very important as we move forward, as we look at telehealth and telemedicine and with our nursing home facilities. So there's room there that it will also help us with our socialization needs if we get all of our buildings uh, upgraded and be sure that they have high connectivity. But I think the telehealth 
uh, conversation can help us in that regard. So I think we'll have a, a dual accomplishment there if we get all of our facilities and we understand where the connectivity issues are. So with that, I apologize, but I also have to go. I'm very uh, pleased to be working with this subcommittee. I think it's great work. So thank you all thank very you. much. Thank, thank you, Representative Hardy. Have a nice what holiday. She said. Representative Hughes, I just echo what everything Rep McCarty said. Yeah, okay. everything. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Anybody else before we find down? All right. Well, I want to thank you for being here today. Um, this ends our meeting for this week, and I hope everybody has a fantastic holiday. If I don't see you between now and then, all right. Happy holidays. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Happy holiday. If I can stop this. Though.